Hi there, I'm Brian Ganserite. Great to be back with another video. I'm with Rebellion Ranch and Sunflower Studio here today with a conversation that it's essentially about pasture raised livestock and animal products versus the industrial grain fed counterparts, specifically focusing in on the dangers of mycotoxins. A lot of the time we talk about what's in grass fed and pasture finished livestock that makes it better. But today the conversation is more about what's in the industrial raised or grain finished livestock that actually makes it toxic to you. I came across a fascinating research paper from Portugal about mycotoxins full of information I want to share with you. I know right now you're super excited, right? But I, I swear this is really important information and only one of the groups of toxins actually assaulting you and your loved one's health through the food stream. Roundup and other chemicals aren't part of today's focus, but I'll leave a link to a must-see video from After School that covers that in great detail. Chronic disease is rampant today, and unfortunately, most of the medical field looks at each disease as an isolated incident. Many of us have woken up, though, and realized that we've been poisoned with industrial food marketed to us by the media for many years now. At the risk of oversimplifying it, most chronic disease is a result of inflammation, and inflammation is almost always a result of your environment and, more importantly, the foods and other substances that we ingest and then their impact on our gut biome. The gut biome and metabolism are something I talk a lot about in my nutritional coaching sessions with clients. There's a lot to go into, but essentially at the end of the day, what we're talking about are the products that get produced in your biome and the effects they have on your system, and these are called metabolites. Metabolites are defined as substances formed in or necessary for metabolism. So, long story short, they're nutrients or toxins either accumulated in food stream or processed by our gut biome. Obviously, if the plants that the livestock consume are inflamed with toxins and chemicals, they accumulate those toxins in their fats, or in products like eggs and milk. Since humans are at the top of the food chain, we further accumulate all of those toxins into our system, and it's no great shock then why we have so many inflammatory diseases in the Western world. This is the driving reason that we practice restorative agriculture, restorative yoga, nutrition coaching, and strength training at Sunflower Studio and Rebellion Ranch. I first became aware of mycotoxins and their impact on our bodies while reading Dave Asprey's book, The Bulletproof Diet, which I highly recommend, and I'll have a link for it in the description. This is what led me to deep dive into this 2019 study published on the NIH website, which is also linked in the description, to summarize the information there and make people aware of these horrible toxins, which are so much more prevalent in the food stream than you can imagine. So today's video is going to spare you the trouble of reading through a 60-page study and hopefully familiarize you with the world of mycotoxins and how they impact livestock feed and then further on how they impact you. We'll be covering the different types of mycotoxins all the way from the ZINs to the TRCs along with their threats specific to each type of mycotoxin. Uh, we're going to go into feed quality for livestock grain usage throughout the world, occurrence, precautions, and detection. The use of grains has skyrocketed for livestock feed over the last century with the rise of industrial farming, and the study points out that up to 70% of cereal grains harvested are used in the diet of animals. This won't come as a surprise to anybody that has driven through the United States only to see farms that once had hundreds of acres of pasture land are now converted into row crops, with the livestock consolidated into smaller and smaller areas on the farm. This is all part of the industrialization of farming as we know it, which reflects the data from the USDA that between 1950 and 1970, the number of farms actually declined by half before leveling off and the average farm went from about 205 acres to about 400 acres in 1969. The quality of these livestock feeds is actually much lower and not held to the same standards as the grains that humans consume directly. Many of the livestock feeds also include byproducts from oilseed crops, which is another topic for another day. 
Some of these include soybeans, cottonseed, sunflower, sesame, palm oils, which I hope to cover in another video soon. As for the precautions taken for mycotoxins, this paper discusses an effort in the EU to regulate accepted levels in animal feeds. But it goes on to point out it's impossible to guarantee that they would be free from these toxins. The legislation, according to the paper, is subject to scientific, economic, and political influence from country to country. So it's hard to imagine there would be much consistency till we get a little further down the road. There are a whole range of scientific methods used to detect these mycotoxins in the livestock feed discussed in this paper, but we won't deep dive into that today. You can read about that specifically in the study if you'd like to. And again, the link's down in the description. As for the occurrence of these mycotoxins, they can start in the field during the crop growing cycle and continue through into the harvesting, drying, processing, and storage of the grains, depending on various environmental factors. The paper even goes on to say that factors like geographic location, agricultural process, practices, the year that it was harvested in, and the length of the conditions of storage can affect the extent of the contamination of a particular commodity. Here's where the paper gets really interesting for me, though, is the small statement that says, quote, however, the substrate susceptibility to fungal invasion plays a major role in mycotoxin production, unquote. I need to dive a little deeper into this topic, but to me, it sounds a lot like the general soil health as a whole has one of the biggest impacts on the abundance and prevalence of mycotoxins in this livestock feed. More directly, the lack of soil health and industrial farming conditions. Now let's get into the mycotoxins and their threats. The research paper says there are approximately three to 400 mycotoxins that have been identified and reported so far. And they're broken down into some main groups concerning human toxicity. Those being AFs, FMs, OTs, TRCs, and ZENs. So let's start with AFs, the first type of mycotoxins that the paper talks about. And these can affect you directly from crops that you consume straight from the field or through animal products like eggs, milk, meat, obviously. Animals that are fed with the contaminated feeds from the AFM1, the particular strand of mycotoxin, it's the most commonly occurring alpha toxin. And it's also listed as possibly being carcinogenic to humans. These AFs are also responsible for chronic disease and death in livestock. Signs of this toxicity in your livestock can include gastrointestinal dysfunction, anemia, jaundice, hemorrhage, reduction in weight gain, lower feed efficiency, decreased egg and milk production, and inferior carcass quality, not to mention increased susceptibility to environmental and microbial stressors. The paper goes on to say that ultimately prolonged exposure to even low dietary levels of these toxins can result in extensive functional and structural liver lesions, including cancer, and that it's important to note that nursing animals as well are exposed to the AFB1 toxin, toxic metabolite secreted in milk. After reading this, I truly can connect the dots of a lot of troubles we had with our own livestock through the years. The next group of mycotoxins are the FMs, including an FB1 strain, which is listed as also being possibly carcinogenic in human beings and able to disrupt biosynthesis. The paper goes on to say that these toxins cause significant diseases in horse, swine, and rabbits, which are more sensitive to them than cattle and poultry are, with primary symptoms of lethargy, blindness, decreased feed intake, and ultimately ending in convulsion and deaths in pigs. It's associated with pulmonary disease, edema, weakness, cyanosis, and death. Obviously a pretty serious thing to uh, be worried about being in your food stream. OTs are the next group, and they're primarily associated with damaging the kidneys. High doses in the diet can cause liver damage, damage to lymphoid tissue, necrosis in the intestinal tissue, paper also states that these particular toxins have been linked to fatal kidney disease, typical in Balkan countries, and are possibly carcinogenic. TRCs are the next group, and it's a class of fungal metabolites that are found to inhibit proteins and DNA synthesis and weakened cellular immune responses. 
And animal symptoms include decreased feed intake, weight gain, bloody diarrhea, hemorrhaging, oral lesions, low egg and milk production, abortion, and even death in some cases. They go on to say that low to moderate levels of this mycotoxin lead to increased susceptibility to pathogens and poor performance. Zins are the last category of mycotoxins focused on in this report, and it says that they've got a general capability of binding to estrogen receptors, causing adverse effects associated with reproductive disorders and hyperestrogenism, both in human beings and breeding animals. Obviously, these aren't things that we can ignore, and they have important downstream effects on, on the population. The last area of threats we'll talk about are just the general threats that all of these mycotoxins have, and those include retarded growth, impaired immunity, and decreased disease resistance, perhaps even death. Most of these compounds are very stable, and they're not destroyed during storage, milling, high temperature, or the feed manufacturing processes. Whether you're a livestock producer or a food consumer, it's obvious that being aware of these mycotoxins and their dire consequences is absolutely necessary. Obviously, I have a bias for natural farming practices, but I think it goes beyond any bias and shows that large-scale industrial farming is bad for animals and bad for human beings. If our entire food supply is inflamed, it's no surprise that we have a population that finds itself inflamed with chronic disease. Bringing awareness to these issues is the only way to cause change through market forces. I hope you found this information very useful and that you leverage it to benefit your health and that of your family and your livestock. We offer private nutritional and agricultural coaching, virtually and in person. You can get more details at sunflowerstudiokc.com. Again, the link's in the description or rebellionranch.com. Again, I truly thank you for your time in this video. And I'll have another one out to you soon. Have a great day.